got me my first real job here in Australia, uh, and that was with um, Tommy Tico's Channel 7 Orchestra. And I'll al always be immensely grateful to Julian for that opportunity. Everything he does has got a little stamp of uh, a quality about it, you know. It just sounds right. Well, he's just, so, just that talented, you know. But he actually, he played the trumpet. And I believe he played saxophone in the early days. He doesn't play the horns anymore very much. He still plays a bit of flugelhorn occasionally. He doesn't play the flugelhorn anymore much these days, but he was a very fine player on that too. <laughs> Uh, well, I used to play classical music, and of course, there are still a lot of blues in jazz, although it's referred to as a different thing by the young people, but that's where it came from in the first place. So that uh, we still play blues, but not the kind of blues that is specialised by uh, some of the blues uh, singers and, and performers who are around now. But uh, I, I play all kinds of music. I don't strictly stick, stick to jazz. I... Um, I'm very fond of all music, except perhaps uh, some of the contemporary uh, pop music, which doesn't really appeal to me, but that's because of an age difference, a generation gap. I've heard Ju Julian described as, uh, as being a guy who's got a mind like a steel trap. He misses absolutely nothing of the sounds that are going on around him in the world, you know, birds and cars. and he, uh, he, I think he creates his own mental pictures. He uses sound the way we use our eyes. I think that's, that's probably the, the way to describe it. We, of course, blind people live in a world of sound, you know, and, and we get from the sounds of things what you get from the pictures. And uh, someone wrote a letter into Don saying that, uh, you know, yeah, they sort of quite enjoyed it, but, you know, well, for heaven's sake, why don't you get a piano player who smiles? <laughs> you sat there like he was blind or something, you know, and I mean, that's really, yeah. So Julian was actually quite amused by that, so I guess that harkens back to his sense of humour. Oh, well, I think it, uh, you've got complete uh, concentration. You're not distracted by looking around, etc. You're, you're not dividing your attentions between seeing and hearing. Um, but, of course, I'm speaking with great authority because I've never seen, so I don't really know. He's, he's very well respected all around the world. He lived in uh, L.A. for a long time. And every second guy said, oh, you, you know Julian, how's he going? And you know, In fact, the guy who was taking me around was a friend of Julian's, a trumpet player called Yuan Racy, and he introduced me as Julian's bass player. And I think he arranged for Frank Sinatra and a few other people, and I think he perhaps worked on some film scores. He spent quite a lot of time over there, I know. When I first started playing jazz, it was the days of the Benny Goodmans and Art Tatum and uh, people like that. That's uh, well, I hate to tell you, about 50 years ago. There seems to be really not, not much of a limit to things he can't do. I mean, he still plays the piano beautifully.
see, the pop music of my day was was the Glenn Millers and all those people, you see. But I enjoy quite a lot. There's some still some very good music written by fellows like Stevie Wonder and and um, Ray Charles I've been following since the the 50s, you know. He's been in the 50s and 60s. He was a saxophone player and a piano player, uh, really in the jazz idiom before he became sort of more or less um, a middle-of-the-road type. There's all kinds of stories about Julian. Uh, no interview was complete without a few anecdotes. I remember... And they're up like on the ladder, you know, like you ends up on the roof with a hammer. <laughs> and Julian's on the ladder holding all the tools, you know. And all of the musicians got really drunk and they said to Julian, look, man, you're going to have to drive home. And he dropped the hammer. He said, heads. And uh, the policeman went over to the driver's window and said, sir, do you realise you're driving all over the road? And Julian goes, well, I just caught the hammer. And... Uh, they wouldn't believe that he was blind. He must have heard it go blah, 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 down the thing and like must have judged how far it was. I mean, it could have been a fluke too, but at the same time he did it. That's, that's, that's the way it is, you know. Yeah. Then all in all, I think Jules is a marvellous bloke. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's had a few unhappy times in his life and um, he surmounts all that. He's always cheerful. Yeah, I think his dad worked on the railways or something like that. And uh, they were like a fairly you know, poor working class group of people. And the fact that he was blind meant that he wasn't going to be able to work on the railways like his dad did. And so they thought, well, gee, what do we do? Let's, t let's teach him the piano. I've got quite a lot of sound effects of, of steam trains. It's always been a hobby of mine, um, because I grew up and travelled a lot on trains when they were the old steamers. And, you know, you flog your memory from time to time. Julian Lee in one word. Could it be a long sentence? He picks it. You know, courage and patience and... Remarkable. Perseverance, tenacity, strength. He's got all those things. It's pretty scary stuff, that. <laughs> A monster. Mm. I've done, I guess, you know, a couple of... A couple of, well, several hundred gigs with him now over the last ten years. And I think that of all the people I've worked with, I've probably learnt more from him from his musical ability and him as a human being than I've learned from anybody else. So, yeah, that'll do. Well, did you hear about the guy that walked into David Jones and picked his guide dog up by the tail and swung it round his head? <laughs> One of the assistants came over and said, what are you doing, are you all right? He said, no, I'm just having a look around. <laughs> <laughs> When I was 12, I watched an old film. I remember the sounds and the images, which have stayed with me ever since. Amazing images. People were laughing, walking outside under large, enormous trees. They were even breathing the air outside their city. How can this be? The sky was so blue, with white cumulus clouds like cushions floating above the laughing. People swam in blue waters and walked on dark green earth like our own. The sun was white, not red. People were in love with the sun and spent their days outside. They tell it as nothing but a film full of magic and special effects. So why did they make a film like that? A film that is not just a film, a film that is 
gone, like the ideas I had when I was 12. A film that asks a question I cannot answer, with animals I've never seen, cultures that don't exist. What I do know is that I wish I was in this film. US President Bill Clinton today announced wide-ranging plans to battle the greenhouse effect, which is damaging American farmers' wheat crops this year. The ozone layer is at present at a very stable state. There can be no way of solving this horrific problem. The effects of the greenhouse disaster water level in Antarctica are suffering from the effects of radiation. Because of his government, President Brown addressed the world today. The United States, I promise you. Brown outlined the plans for major American cities to move underground. I grew up around factories, choking, the slow thud, the humming production lines, the weird smell produced. Heat, staying inside when it rained. The acid melted my bike and paint on the roof. So I was glad when we moved to a new place in the city, underground. The new city 